keeper of the star, Lord of time and space. I will live my life lifting up your name. to see Thank you for the cross and the life you singing this morning, y'all. Glad to be in church today. Yes. Wow, that's a good answer. Y'all are more awake than I thought. the cloud. 
every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise who can stop the lord almighty our god is a lion a lion of judah he's roaring with power and fighting our battles every knee will bow He is roaring in power. Do you believe that? And we also said he is fighting our battles. I'd like to hear some testimony this morning, just briefly. Just say out, Lord, you're fighting my battle with this, and I trust you. Who'd like to testify? The Lord's fighting your battles, Marie? In what ways? With Danielle. Who else? Amen. Yeah. The Lord fights our battles even in conversation. Somebody just say, uh, Lord, thank you for fighting my battles with. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Lord, thank you for fighting my battle with. Absolutely. Absolutely. Who else? Lord, thank you for fighting my battle. Absolutely. Somebody else. Let's give the Lord some glory. With your health. That's right. You do not fight your own battles. You rest in the hands of an almighty God who is roaring in power. Let's sing that again. And let's give him everything that we're carrying and just tell him, thank you for fighting my battles. Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Answer me. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Why don't you uh, take a moment to turn and greet somebody next to you. Say hi this morning. Love that everybody is here and get to interact with one another, uh, even get to hear each other's stories. Welcome to Crossroads Church of Dunwoody. As you're finding your seat, let me just welcome you. You can be set, uh, seated for a moment. Let me highlight just a few things that I think are worthy of our attention. Uh, next uh, Sunday uh, evening, I want to invite you to join uh, uh, Jews for Jesus uh, as Mark Landrum comes and shares Christ in the Passover. Uh, it's helpful for us as, uh, as Gentiles, if you're not a former uh, Jew convert now to Christ, if you're a Gentile, you uh, perhaps don't understand the, the significance of the Passover meal that Jewish people have that was really a, a forerunner of what uh, Christ fulfilled. And so uh, once you gather together next uh, Sunday evening at 7 o'clock to hear how the elements within the Passover are all pointing to Jesus. We live in a, a high uh, population of Jewish people all around us, 
and it is very helpful when you understand uh, their belief system and you can point them to the Messiah they've been longing for. And so uh, let's pray for that. Uh, also, next Sunday afternoon, there's a team of eight people uh, flying to Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya, uh, who will be ministering with the orphans and also the churches there. Uh, if you have any clothes that you'd like to donate for 5-year-old through 12-year-olds, we'll, we'll receive that. Or if you want to write a handwritten letter just to encourage one of the orphans, we're going to take those with us. Uh, in addition, we've heard that uh, uh, the director of, our, um, uh, of the orphanage uh, has, a, uh, has an outdated uh, computer, I mean, very old, it's not functioning uh, to the capacity they really need, and so we're uh, going to be receiving some extra uh, offerings for that. If you'd like to give towards the purchase of a, a new laptop for them, we're going to try to get that before we leave and take that, personally del deliver that to the director. So any ways you can help in that, that would be uh, phenomenal. But uh, this is our opportunity to receive our offering, uh, to give towards missions and to give uh, towards the work of the church. So uh, let's pray together and our uh, ushers will be coming from the back moving forward. Father, thank you for being a fantastic God in our lives, that you've revealed your glory, you've drawn us to yourself. And Father, um, to realize that you get more glory the more we really just turn it all over to you. That we don't try to fight our battles to impress you. No, we just surrender our lives to you that you would fight our battles and we'd see your power and glory. Father, I, I pray that as we uh, have come to Christ and now we want to be a part of your kingdom, let us participate, uh, not only uh, financially, but, but with our time and our, our faith that everything is for you, and we pray that others would be drawn into your kingdom. Bless our offering, bless our time together, bless our worship, Father, and let us not just worship in this time and place, but let us be worship lifestyle people, that everywhere we go, we're, we're seeking your face and proclaiming your glory to the nations. And we pray this in Jesus' name.
Sometimes it's not so well, is it? Right? The scripture says we can say it anyway. And sometimes we need to say it so that we start feeling it. Right? Am I right, Marie? We're singing about the goodness of God. We're singing about the power. Our God is mighty. Powerful. He's a lion. He's a force in the universe and he and he loves us. Oh how he loves us. And he doesn't want anything to defeat us in this life. Sickness adversity heartache oh a bunch of the things that were named here just minutes ago we're not we're not slaves to that we're victorious in all things right because of him not because of us we don't have it we don't have the strength we don't have the power he does Yeah. 
is a creation of God the children of God have been born again in Christ have faith in him have been redeemed bought at a precious price and never take that for granted we are co-heirs with Christ we have been adopted we have been rescued we've been redeemed and that is an eternal relationship We've learned so much of these truths already through the book of Ephesians. If you would, turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians as we continue our verse-by-verse trek through this. We're in chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, please use the red Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Uh, You can turn to page 977, and you'll be able to pick right up in Ephesians 4 where we are. Uh, if you personally don't have a Bible or your, your Bible's kind of torn apart and you'd like a new Bible, I'd just encourage you to pick up and take that red Bible with you. That is our gift uh, from the church to you because a Bible uh, being used in your home on a daily basis is far better than a Bible sitting in a pew rack collecting dust all week. So we want you to have the living word of, of God. Uh, so take that. Ephesians chapter 4, we're, uh, we're going to look at verses 7 through 12, Lord willing, as we walk through what, uh, uh, what he's beginning to unveil about our response uh, to the incredible power that he has already displayed in our lives. Ephesians chapter 1 displays uh, uh, the magnificence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the triune Godhead who has uh, rescued us since the foundation of the world. He was uh, developing His divine sovereign plan to to redeem people to Himself, sealing us for the day of redemption. He shows us in chapter 2 of Ephesians that we are spiritually dead. We are not able to do anything for ourselves, but He makes us alive in him. He calls us uh, uh, to come out of the the tomb, if you will, and to embrace uh, all that he is and what he's doing through us as he fills us with the Holy Spirit. It is by faith that we are saved by grace, not of ourselves that no one can boast, but in that, even in the faith that we have, he uh, makes us his workmanship to do the works that he has already planned for us to, to do. In chapter 3, it just continues on about how now he's, he's pulling together Jews and Gentiles, uh, those that were far off and those that were near, but uh, no one had faith in, in, the, in the Messiah, the Savior, and now those who are co- uh, committing their lives to Christ, though they were uh, far apart in, in ideology, far apart in culture, under Christ they become one. That people from all over the world can sit together and love one another because of their overflowing love that they have in God. And so that is a good thing, the unity that he pulls together. These are things that only God can do. You know, how could he take... a Jewish convert that survived the Holocaust and sit with a, a German convert and let them be friends? Only God can do that. How can he take people that were so, uh, a KKK member who's been now converted to Christ and take a Black Panther 
from the 60s and have them be best friends, which these are all documented cases. In Christ, all barriers come down because we are surrendered to our King and now we are brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the power of God and only God can do that. So that's the first three chapters of Ephesians that he, he's displaying what God is doing to, to, to develop and, and display His glory through the church. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 uh, begin to unveil our response, our participation in view of God's holiness and glory in His activity. What do we do in His power? It's not our power. It is His power through His people. And, and really the, the, the crux of the, the entire um, book of Ephesians is found in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. It's the theme of the entire book as we call it, Dream Bigger. Uh, why don't we read this together? Uh, we've been going over this for, I think this is our 17th or 18th message in this. Uh, but let's read this out loud together, if you will. Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us that ought to be a verse you commit to memory because you're, you can be reminded that God is able that's a great truth and not only is he able he's able to do far more abundantly and not only just far more abundantly he's going to do far more abundantly than you could ever ask that's praying and anything you could think, dream, or imagine. As high as the height is that you, you can think, God's even able to do far greater than that. Because we limit ourselves, sometimes we limit who God is. And God is almighty, all-powerful. He can do anything His will determines. And we ought to start uh, depending more upon the God who is versus the God we've created in our minds that is little and controlled by us. But not only is he able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, he does that according to his power that works within you. This is not some power a part over here that you may see through someone else. No, his heart is to work his power through you. So therefore, it's not dependent upon you and your power. It's dependent upon him and his power through you. He doesn't have to do it this way. He could just, he created the entire world with no input on your, uh, from you. Didn't wait till you were created to say, let there be light. But it's interesting that God in his divine sovereignty has chosen sinful, weak vessels to redeem and then bring into display, hey, now I'm going to really show off here. You saw I could create and then even some of the people uh, won't believe that, but I'm going to show you how my glory is displayed. I'm going to work through those you would never imagine I could work through. I can take a Paul or a Saul and turn him into a Paul. I can take Chris, who was running in different directions and had his own issues, and I can take him, transform him, give him nine kids, give him a pulpit, and we'll see what God can do. I got some people here today that know me from all the way back, and they are sworn to secrecy on some of those things. But it is amazing what God has desired to do through me. But it's not limited to me. God is developing you to display his power for his glory. And he's not through working in you. So now I want to know, well, what does he want to do? Uh, well, really, what is his divine plan? And he's unveiling that over these three chapters and, and you need to be tuning in praying that the spirit would illuminate these truths that you would not only understand them but you're willing to trust them and obey them and say I just want to be a vessel used of God not let me get in the way God I don't want to run ahead of you I don't want to lag behind I just want to walk in step with your spirit to see what you will do through me so let's see what he's doing last week we spoke of the power that works within us, plural, through the church, which includes spiritual unity. 
The, the unity of bringing people all, from all over together to work together, to love one another, to depend upon the same God. We have the same head, but we are all part of the body. This week, I want us to focus on spiritual diversity. There is unity, but it's not uniformity. We don't all wear the same uniform in a sense that we do the same functions. We are gifted in, and designed in various ways. And that's the beauty of the church, that we can all be very different but all working towards the same uh, perspective and, and goal. There's spiritual maturity that we'll look at and there's spiritual identity. But today, let's just focus on the diversity. What does this diversity look like? What is God really doing in uh, and through our lives collectively? Look at verse 7. We'll start here. And uh, the first point you can write down if you're taking notes today is the church has been given diverse gifts. That's a good thing for us, that we're not all alike. How many of you are accountants or detailed type of people? Raise your hand. Don't, be proud. That's right. And when we gather all of them, they have great minds to think of things. All right? And I love sitting in a room with them and just uh, the beautiful minds are in the room. And I'm dreaming big on things and I'm saying, we ought to do this. And the account's going, okay. Nope, that won't work. Nope. No, nope, no, nope, you got it. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? And, and I go, why do we got to think about all the details? Why do we got to pay for it all? Why, God's just going to give us everything. The accountants, Lord bless them. Keep me in line. But put a whole a bunch of dreamers in the same room or, or, or put a bunch of sales guys in the same room. They don't know anything about details. They frustrate their accountants. They make big promises and they just run forward. Yes, Ken? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, they, they, they dream big. You put them all together, they've got great plans. But nobody's in the room to really think of, well, who's going to actually accomplish all those great plans? You can have these great visions, and, and, and thousands of people are going to do this, but have you talked to those thousand people yet? Have, have you really developed the, the, the details and the structure of all that? This is the beauty of the church. God has wired us all very differently, and we need each other. Would you agree? Isn't the beauty of your marriage is that, that what attracted you to your spouse was that they were a little different than you? Oh, they, they, they had some, some you know, things different about them. Oh, that's so cute. Or, oh, that's so nice. And, oh, yeah, I, I really love that. And then six months after you've been married, the thing that attracted you to them now annoys you? Because why can't they be like me? You know, why can't they fold the clothes the same way I fold the clothes? right? Jennifer and I had these arguments early in our marriage because there are certain ways to fold towels and she didn't get trained on that. So I had to train her on how to fold towels and she still doesn't know how to fold towels right. But I came to the conclusion I don't want to fold towels anyway. Do it yourself. Knock yourself out. It doesn't matter to me. But this, this thing is we're very different and sometimes that's attractive and then sometimes it annoys us and we try to make others more like us when God has designed them to not be anything like you and you ought to celebrate the diversity even in your own home and especially in the church. We're always going, why can't they be more like me? And what you're saying is, God, you didn't consult me before you created them, and I'm offended. Have you ever thought they might be thinking the same thing about you? God has developed and designed his church to be very diverse. Aren't you glad in this world we don't just have three primary colors? That when you blend those colors together, you get every color in the rainbow and beyond. God is a very creative and colorful God if everything was just green then we'd have green carpet and I wouldn't be excited about that I'm not thrilled about our carpet now if we ever want to change that you can go ahead and give some money now write down carpet we're going to change it to be great all right I'm trying to, to plug in my announcement so but diversity I want you to look at verse 7 now it's up on the screen but please look at your Bibles if you have those that's preferable but grace was given what, what does it say in the, uh, up on the screen? Given to who? I don't want you to miss that because some in their interpretation start focusing on just a few in the Bible or a few in the, in, the, in the body, but it's really about each one of us. And I believe when Paul's writing this, he's talking to the whole church. 
Why? Because he's been talking to the whole church, chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. So why would he then limit what God is doing to just a few? He's saying that the grace was given, which, by the way, grace in its its own definition is, is the giving of, receiving something from someone, it's grace, that you didn't deserve, they gave it freely. But the grace was given to each one of us, plural, according to the measure of Christ's gift. That he's desiring to give each one of you a measure, whatever measure he desires, whatever uh, uh, flavor that he wants to make you. It's his gift given to you. Every person who is in Christ is gifted by the grace of God. We do not all receive the same gifts. And even how those are manifested, even though we may have similar gifts, how it's manifested will always be unique to us. That's the beauty of of the diversity of the church. The body of Christ is beautiful in its mixture of unity and diversity. I want you to consider just two chapters in the Bible that, that, that display some of these truths of how he puts together the body and how we're very different. Uh, both of them are chapter 12. One of them is in Romans chapter 12 and one of them is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Listen to the words from Romans. Starting in verse 3, it says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but think with a sober judgment, according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Very similar language in uh, Romans chapter 12. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. That's a good thing. So we, though many, are one body. It just goes from this unity to diversity, diversity back to unity. We are one body, individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, plural. Let us use these gifts. If prophecy in proportion to our faith if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Every one of us will be very different. And we need one another to be a full functioning body. How many of you have lost some body parts, whether internal or external? Yeah. And sometimes you didn't even know you had that part until they said, it's got to go. A couple of years ago, I was in severe pain, and, uh, and I was in tears. And I, I'm not a guy who likes to go to the doctor. I don't like the dentist. I don't like the doctor. I'm just fine the way I am. So, but I was in such severe pain, I begged my wife, take me to the emergency room. It was early in the morning. And I got, get there, and they do their scans and all, and they say, you have a gallbladder. And I'm like, what is it even for? I, I don't know. Do, how many of you know what the gallbladder is for? Some of you know because you've had some complications, but it's not something I learned in high school. Oh, gallbladder, this is kind of the, a special little function. Anyway, they say you, only have, you not only have a gallbladder, it's about twice the size as it's supposed to be. You know, and so, yes, we had this big gallbladder and it had to come out. And, uh, and I knew I must have been on my deathbed because Marie Leon shows up with, the, uh, with Danielle at the hospital and I'm thinking, oh Lord, I'm... I'm Ready to see you. Apparently, gallbladder is a big deal. If it takes out, we're gonna, we're, I'm going to be gone. But they prayed for me, and, and we went to the hospital. They took it out, and I got out, and I learned all kinds of things about what a gallbladder do, did because I no longer have a gallbladder. I have a gallbladderless menu uh, that I can eat from now, unfortunately. There are parts of our body that when we don't have it, there's something missing. And so when we consider the church of the God's diversity, every one of us have different gifts, And if one of the parts is not functioning properly, we all suffer from that. That you are an important part of God's diverse plan within his body. And you say, well, no, uh, well, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a teacher. I don't sing. I'm not an accountant. I can't keep Chris in line on the budget. Well, what other gifts might he be displaying through you that we all need? We can't be the full functioning body of Christ or see the, the holy power of God through us until we all surrender to the fact that we are all gifted in different ways, but we have to function as one unit in a body for his glory. 
God has given us each a gift. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, let me just read a few verses. It says in verse 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. Every person ought to be informed about their gift. It goes down to verse 4. It says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. From the front pew to the back pew, everyone is a part of the body. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Do you realize your gift was given to you for the glory of God, but the benefit of all? I want you to think about this, just a couple of expectations that God has for you. Based on my study of Scripture, uh, and these two chapters and a few others, God has given us a grace gift to everyone in His church with these three expectations. The first is that every Christian who has a gift, which everyone does, will recognize it as a gift and not as a product of his own skill or his own ingenuity. Second expectation is that the recipient of the gift will recognize his gift as only one gift among many gifts. So he's not elevated, she's not greater than, she just has a gift, but still dependent upon the power of God and the other gifts that are demonstrated within the body. The third expectation of every Christian, as they, they, they have a gift, the recipient will be eager to use it, not for his own glory, but for the benefit of the entire body, and thus for the glory of God. Your gift is given to you so that others would benefit and God would get the glory. If you sit there on your padded potential and say, I don't know if I've got a gift, you've already discounted what the Lord has communicated to you through his holy word. If you say, yeah, well, I've got a gift, but, but I don't know. I don't really know what to do with it. Well, just begin to study and read and pray and God will demonstrate his power even through some of your ignorance. It's amazing. There are times I don't even know I'm being used of God. And, and I'll hear later, you know, what you said to me or how you treated me or, or, or just that particular way you, you, you did something really blessed me and ministered to me. When you were being you, is what they're saying in a sense, when you were being you for the glory of God, I benefited from that. I've sat on a pew and watched other people worship and I have been incredibly blessed. I've sat in, in different groups and just see how someone interacts with another, and I'm like, oh, Lord, you just convicted me. I should, I should be acting more that way towards others. Listen, when you are you for the glory of God, you are giving him glory, and other people are benefiting. It's for the common good. Don't neglect the gift that God has given you. The church has been given diverse gifts. Here's the second thing that as we comb through this text, the church has been given divine victory. Now this is one of the, the oddest places in scripture uh, as uh, I've, I've struggled with this for years in a sense that how does this uh, verse 8, 9, and 10 fit in the context of what he's saying here? Because he starts talking about a, a, a descending and ascending and then the Apostles' Creed say so he descended to the lower parts and, and maybe went to hell and rescued people and brought them up out of hell and brought them to heaven and all kinds of things. So I, I want you to see the, the verse here. It says, uh, therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave, gave, here's the giving again, he gave gifts to men. Look at verse 9 and 10. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, comma, the earth? It may say something a little different in your translation. In the English Standard Version, it puts the comma trying to help you define what lower regions means. So the earth, he came from heaven to earth, who, and he who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. You can go to the next slide. We'll just go back up to verse 8. The church has been given divine victory. So as I, I, I scan through this, and, and there are various arguments for various things on this, and they say, well, what is this descended? Does that mean on the cross, when he died, he, he went to hell for, for a couple of days, rescued the captives in hell, and then brought them to heaven? If that aligned with all other teachings of Scripture, I would believe it. 
but I do not believe that. I do not believe he went to hell and rescued anyone. If you want a relationship with Jesus Christ, you want to be forgiven and go to heaven, you don't do that in hell because there is no redemption in hell. There is opportunity here on this earth. There's no second chance. Now, some say it's, it's more the purgatory, it's the holding. They're not in hell, they're just kind of in purgatory waiting for someone to release them. Perhaps that was just the Old Testament saints that, that were kind of in limbo before they went to heaven. Perhaps that is it. I'm not convinced of that at all. In the whole teaching of here, I don't think he's taking a left turn saying, oh, let me just tell you about heaven and hell. I don't think that's it at all. I believe this is what he is doing. Paul is writing. He's saying, look, there's a unity in the church. Now there's a diversity of gifts. Let me tell you how the gifts were even uh, 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 given to you. There was a God in heaven on high. He took on human flesh. He descended down to the earth. He took on the, the struggles that we have. He conquered death. He rose from the grave. He ascended back to heaven. He came down to where you were so that you could be where he is, but when he came down, what he was able to accomplish was not only your salvation, but he brought you into the church so that he would give you gifts to live out while you're still on this earth. In the flow of this chapter, I believe that has to be the focal point. Now, let me share a few other things about that. In the Old Testament, there, the, the idea of ascending, Old Testament and New Testament, the idea of ascending has to do with uh, two activities. One is drawing near to the presence of God. The other activity is that you would be celebrating victory. All right, let me take the first one. So the ascending, when you talk about ascending, what is he doing? It's drawing near to the presence of God. So in the Old Testament, a couple of places, the, the tabernacle was set up on a hill, and so people went up, ascended to it. The temple was built on the, on the mountain of Jerusalem, same thing, where the priest would ascend. There was a section in the book of Psalms, chapter 120 to 134, that are called the Book of Ascent. And this is the, the psalms they would sing when they were going up the steps to the temple or, or to the presence of God in their holy worship. They would sing these psalms. Let me give you an example. Psalm 121. Listen to what they would sing. I lift my eyes to the hills. I'm ascending. Where does my help come from? It ain't down here. It's ascending. I want to ascend to his presence. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He did not uh, let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The, the sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. When you ascend or descend, you're ascending to the presence of God. You want that, but he will keep you in all places. Ascend, used nine times in the ESV, Old Testament, New Testament. Three times used right here, verse 8, verse 9, and verse 10. It's only six other times this word ascended is even used. Let me give you some examples. In Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. Who ascended to heaven and came down? Who has gathered the wind with his fist? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? What is his son's name? Surely you know. When you're speaking of ascending, surely you know that's only God who came from heaven down to the earth. In John chapter 3, verse 13. Jesus said, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. In John chapter 20, verse 17, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father, your Father, to my God and your God. So here, Jesus is ascending to the presence of the Father. But the other way that ascending is used is in the Old Testament in chapter 68 of the Psalms. And this is what Paul is quoting from when he gets to verse 8. 
In Psalm 68, it's speaking about the, the, the ascension of, of victory, that we have conquered uh, an area, a city, a, 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 a territory. We've conquered. And the one who was leading the conquering now has a parade that's taking place of all the spoils and the people that they've captured. There was this huge celebration among all the people because of what they were able to conquer. Now I want you to listen to Psalm 68, verse 18, which is where Paul is drawing from when he writes Ephesians 4, verse 8. It says in Psalm 68, verse 18, You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train, and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell, dwell there. Now here is this, this picture, the conquering king who, who's came and captured an area, and now he's got his, all the captor, uh, captives walking through the town in this parade. He got all the spoils they were able to collect. And it says that they, uh, as the captives are in the train, and they are receiving the gifts among men. We're, we're taking back all that is for us. Now I want you to hear that word receiving, and I want you to look back at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Paul takes a little liberty and changes that word. What does he say? Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. He's quoting the verse, but by the Holy Spirit, he's able to change how it's being applied. It's not about what's being received by the captor, it's what's being received by those who were captured. Who was captured? Who are these, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives. Who were the captives? Those he was calling to himself that were under bondage and slavery by another king. And he came from heaven, descended down, and he conquered sin, death, and hell, and brought you in. And now, in beautiful display, he's, he's not taking you down in his parade, making you the captive. He's actually now releasing you to full freedom in him. And it's not about what he's receiving. It's about what now he's giving you, not only in salvation, but what he's giving you for his glory in this new identity as a child of God. That is beautiful. Now, there's a couple other things that I'm still grappling with on this. His reference to the captives, that description of Christ's people being conquered, now freed, and, and, and not only are, are they receiving gifts from him, uh, quite frankly, I want to I understand this context. One of uh, an old seminary professor that I had um, and then wrote years later, his name is Gary Smith. He was at Midwestern. I don't know where he is now, but he wrote in one of his uh, articles, he said, uh, but you, you've got to go back not just from Ephesians 4 back to uh, uh, Psalm 68. He says, do you realize Psalm 68 is connected back to numbers with the Levitical priest? that Numbers connects to Psalm 68, and you need to carry it all the way through. And, and uh, I'm not sure of the interpretation yet, but I want to explain it as simply as I can. I want you to listen to Psalm, or Numbers chapter 18, verse 6. It says, and, and behold, I have taken your brothers, the Levites, taken them, they, 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 you know, they've been set apart now, the Levites from among all the people of Israel, and they are a gift to you, the Israelite people have taken out the, 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 the Levitical priests, so they're now a gift to you as a spiritual leader, given to the, uh, a gift to you given to the Lord to do the service of the tent of meeting. And so I look at that and go, okay, this may explain verse 11 that talks about the apostles, the prophets, uh, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. But, but uh, Dr. Smith says, it may just explain the next part, or it may explain something even greater. He suggests, and I'm grappling, and I don't know, so I'm going to confess that before you. I'm still studying this. He says in the New Testament, it's not just about spiritual leaders being risen above, but if you go back to, or go to 1 Peter chapter 2, that you are a chosen nation, all of you, and you are all a royal priesthood. It may be 
what Paul is writing here by the Holy Spirit's guidance, that, that Christ has not only came and conquered those who were, who were uh, slavery to sin, uh, no longer a slave to fear or sin, been conquered, that they now have been given gifts, and now they, us as the church, are, are, are not only being receiving in gifts, but we are now individually a gift to the church. I think that's a beautiful picture. If Dr. Smith is right, it's not just about certain leaders. It's about you displaying the glory of God as a recipient of gifts and then being made a gift to all the others. That with, if you withhold that which God has created you to be, you're withholding a gift that Christ has desired to give to his church. And I think, ooh, that's, I don't want to be a gift that's still wrapped up, hiding it behind the Christmas tree that nobody saw and did not get to enjoy or find the pleasure of God in. That God has uniquely gifted you. And not only are you a gift to the Father that Christ has redeemed, you're a gift to the church that God wants to show his power through. So as a gift of God to the church, how are we going to display that? How are we going to depend upon God as he works through us? Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. I want you to consider the third point. Verse 11. The church has been given definitive leaders. This is where it begins to understand how we all function together. Throughout church history, there have been various men uh, called out by God to lead in their generation to develop what I would say is the gifts of all the people for the glory of God in the display of His glory in our world. It says, and He gave apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers. Your translation may perhaps say pastors and teachers. Same word, uh, poime. That uh, shepherds, pastors, it's the same phrase. There's only one true pastor, one great shepherd, it's Christ, but he has under shepherds, those who is called out in his kingdom. Uh, I'm just going to share this briefly. As we look at the apostles, uh, I'm absolutely certain that the apostles they're speaking of here is a big A apostle, meaning those chosen by Christ while he was alive, that he called to himself, we, we knew them as the 12 disciples, Judas, of course, abandoned and uh, committed suicide, and then, and then they, uh, they had Matthias being added to them, and then later Saul, walking down the road to Damascus, has a personal encounter with Christ. Christ calls him, and he becomes an apostle. So you have these, these 12 apostles, 13 apostles, that are the apostles, those who are setting the foundation of the church, those who are receiving divine revelation and writing down the, the scriptures that all of us get to benefit from when we open our Bibles. I don't believe there's any more apostles used in that way. There are a lot of people who say, well, I'm an apostle. I mean, I'm going out and, and proclaiming the word. Great, but you're not an apostle that's seen the risen Lord, Jesus Christ, and divinely elected by him to lead the foundation of the church. So historically, I believe this lies out. There was the apostles, and then there were the prophets within the church. But now he's... In this generation, this is what I believe, and we could spend more time on this, but he's given to the church in our generation to lead our churches, the evangelist and the shepherds and teachers. Shepherds and teachers are not two people. It is two roles for the same person. And what are they to do? They're going to equip the believers, the saints in the body, to do the work of ministry. The beautiful thing about the evangelist is that they continue to to, to share the gospel, to proclaim the gospel, to call the church, to, to win the world to Christ. And shepherds and teachers have various roles. There's different names for shepherds and teachers throughout Scripture, what their various roles are. There's bishop. In our tradition, we don't use the term bishop very often, but bishop just means overseer. Uh, uh, bishop is uh, uh, episkopos in the Greek. Episcopalians have bishops because they take the literal Greek word episkopos, bishop, overseer, and apply it that way. But we, biblically, have bishops. There's also presbyteros. 
That's the Greek word, and we know what Presbyterians are. They have elders. So that tradition would call their leaders elders because they're presbyteros, Presbyterians, Episcopos, Episcopalians. Well, we have bishops. Uh, uh, Baptists typically say we just have pastors, shepherds, teachers. But all three roles, Episcopos, Presbyteros, and Poime, which is the shepherd, are all three in the same person, just three different functions. And what is their role? It's really to just shepherd and teach and oversee the development and maturity of the body of Christ. In reality, it's as if when Christ calls out certain individuals to be in these roles, they have been divinely um, called, gifted, guided to say, I have a lot of gifts in the church and your role is to help them display those gifts as I have designed. That's a huge responsibility. So we have a plurality of elders, overseers, pastors, because our goal, our calling, held accountable by God, is that we help people develop the gift that they are so they can display that within the church. You need to come back next week so you can see how that uh, fleshes out for you. If every person has a gift... And if every person has to display that for God's glory, well, how do you do that? And, and who's responsible? You and the pastors, the shepherds, the teachers. Let's make this personal for a moment. You, and that should say have and not has, but you have been given a diverse, or diverse gift. You've been given a diverse gift, a gift within the body that's different than others. That you have been given divine victory to live that out. And you have been given definitive leaders to help you accomplish that. Are you willing to believe it? Are you willing to obey it? Are you willing to embrace it? Nobody sits on a few that does not have a huge place in contribution for the body. We can all sit there and go, why aren't they doing their thing? Maybe I'll just look back in the mirror and say, God, help me to do what you developed me to do. And I'll do it for your glory, and I'll do it in full joy. Let's pray together. As we just consider the weight of what uh, the scriptures have taught us, Father, we do pray that in thanksgiving, in full gratitude for our salvation. But Father, you didn't call us to yourself just so we could say uh, we've been redeemed. You've called us so that we would be ambassadors for you, living out the very truths and, and, and the power of the Spirit within us. You, you've designed us in unique ways. And the body of Christ is, is in need of every individual gift that you have developed within people. That we are all interlinked together. We are all dependent upon one another as we are fully dependent collectively and unified in you. And I pray that you would continue to do your work to develop this local congregation, that we would make an impact on each other's lives as well as the lives outside of these walls and around the world. Help us desire the gifts that you have given us. Help us to desire to, to flesh these out. Help us to, to, to be interlinked and dependent upon one another to become better as a church and as, a, as a, a lighthouse of the gospel. So we thank you for these things. And over the next several weeks, help us to, to truly become the church that you've called us to be. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> You stand and sing with me as we go. We want to remind ourselves of that great truth, who we are. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Oh, I am a child of God. Let's sing that again, okay? I'm no longer a slave to fear. Well, I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Let's
walk in that as we go. Have a great week.